All right, well, we are at week three of journeying through the Bible, and we're going to be in Exodus chapter 1 through 25 this week. Now, before we get there, I do want to say, hey, if you made it through Genesis and you're reading or listening, way to go. And I mean that sincerely. Think about this. In two weeks' time, we went through the entire book of Genesis, which is not a small book. There are 50 chapters. So again, way to go. Let me also add, if you've not begun the reading, this is a great place to begin. Uh, we're not too far behind, and Exodus is a great book. There's so much drama, it's exciting, and I think you'll really enjoy it. Now, as we begin looking at Exodus chapters 1 to 25, we need to remember kind of the big picture, if you will. We need to remember God's promises and His purposes for Abraham and his family. Now God, in Genesis, He came to Abraham and He said, I'm going to bless you and make you into a great nation. But He also says in Genesis chapter 15, verse 13, that though they would become a great nation, this nation, His family, was also going to be afflicted for 400 years. And so this is what begins to take place, what we see in Exodus. Remember, at the end of Genesis, that Joseph, he's the prime minister of Egypt, and he saves his family, Jacob's family, from this severe famine. He also saves the Egyptians. But the kings of Egypt, the pharaohs, over time, they forget who Joseph is and what he has done. And as the people of Israel begin to multiply, as the Lord is blessing them by having children and growing as a people, they get fearful and they put the Israelites in slavery. And it's hard and it's tough and the people, they cry out given their affliction, and the Lord hears their cry, and He is going to deliver them. Now, what we see uh, in the book of Exodus is our history. As believers, this is your history, because through this nation, the Lord is going to give the law, and then one day the Messiah will come, Jesus Christ, and He will be the Savior of the world. He will be our Savior. But also one of the things uh, that we see in the book of Exodus and what I find so fascinating is how uh, what happens to the Israelites so closely resembles what happens in our Christian journey. So the Israelites, they are in bondage. They are in slavery. And Paul says that we too, before we put our faith in Christ, we are in bondage to sin. But God in His great mercy, He redeems. That means He buys the Israelites at a price. And he, he buys them, He purchases them from their slavery. And so too, we are redeemed. We are bought from our sin, that bondage that we're in. And how does the Lord do this with the Israelites? He, as you'll read, provides the Passover lamb. And we too receive the greater, the truer, Passover lamb, Jesus Christ. In the Gospel of John, John the Baptist, when he sees Jesus, he says, Behold the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. Also, we see that the Israelites, as they leave Egypt, they go through the waters of the Red Sea. And so we as Christians, when we put our faith in Christ, we go through the waters of baptism. Also, the Israelites, they receive the law of God, what we commonly uh, refer to as the Ten Commandments. So they receive grace, then they receive the law. And so too, we receive grace when we put our faith in Christ. But we're also to be obedient to God. And we're to be obedient to the law of Christ. And then also as the Israelites, they are journeying to the promised land this land that they were, they were promised so long ago. And so too, we as Christians are journeying to the promised land where one day we will receive the new heavens and the new earth. But the Israelites, this journey is not always easy. It's not always smooth. They're gonna be tested at times. And this is what we experience in the Christian life. We experience times of testing. And so are the Israelites gonna trust God? And are we, in our Christian journey, are we going to trust God? And so again, we see this drama unfold with the people of Israel. And it's so fascinating to see. But also remember that this so closely resembles our Christian walk. And so as you're reading, as you're listening, learn from the Israelites. 
Now, in these videos, we're gonna try again to address some of the challenging or troubling things that we come across. And I wanna highlight two from our reading this week. The first is that we're gonna read time and time again that Pharaoh hardens his heart, but also God hardens Pharaoh's heart. Actually, it's 10 times that we read that Pharaoh hardens his own heart and 10 times that the Lord does this. So what is it? Well, I would say there is some mystery in this. Uh, we see God's sovereignty on display, but also a uh, human responsibility. So I do want to say at the beginning, there is some mystery to this. And we see this throughout the Bible. This, these two things are not in conflict, but the Bible does speak to both of them. But I would also add this. The Lord is showing himself in mighty ways. Uh, he is showing uh, these, these 10 plagues and working mightily. And Pharaoh has a front view to this. And he sees how God is working over and over and over again. Yet he continues to reject God. He continues to rebel against God. And so what the Lord does is this, and I love how theologian Sinclair Ferguson puts it. He says this, when God hardens Pharaoh's heart, God does not create fresh evil in it, but gives Pharaoh over to his already evil desires as an act of judgment. And so God shows himself to Pharaoh time and time again, but Pharaoh continues to reject the Lord. And so the Lord says, okay, and he gives him up to that, and his, his heart is hardened. Now, another challenging part in our reading this week comes a really strange story. It's found in Exodus chapter 4, and I, let me read it to you. And it deals with Moses and his wife and, and one of his sons. And we see this in Exodus chapter 4. It says this, on the way to Egypt, at a place where Moses and his family had stopped for the night, the Lord confronted him, that's Moses, and was about to kill him. But Moses' wife, Zipporah, took a flint knife and circumcised her son. She touched his feet, that's Moses, with the foreskin and said, Now you are a bridegroom of blood to me. When she said a bridegroom of blood, she was referring to the circumcision. After that, the Lord left him alone. That's a strange passage. So what's going on here? And what makes it so strange to me is this. The Lord goes to Moses, the burning bush. He's speaking to Moses, and he's calling Moses to lead the people. And there's this back and forth. Moses is very reluctant. He does not want to do it. And so the Lord and Moses go back and forth. And finally, Moses says, basically, I'll do it, even though he didn't want to. And so he is going back to Egypt to begin to, to lead the people out. But yet in this passage, we see that the Lord meets Moses and he's about to kill Moses. And what go, what's going on is this. If you remember in our reading, Abraham was given uh, the covenant. And the covenant, the sign of this covenant was the sign of circumcision. And Moses, who's an Israelite, had not circumcised his own son. Circumcision meaning this, this visible mark that they are the people of God, that they are separate from the other unbelieving nations. And so Moses, even though he's to lead the people out, he has not been obedient. And the Lord takes this very serious, and he's about to kill Moses. But Moses' wife steps in, she takes care of the situation. All the wives right now are shaking their head going, yeah, that's typical. And so she actually protects Moses. She's obedient to what the Lord has commanded and then Moses is able then to lead the people out of Egypt eventually. Well, good luck in your reading this week. I think you're gonna love it, and we'll see you next time.